everybody. I am so excited for today's show. Um, this is Paul Coliani, who I'll introduce formally in just a minute. Um, and this is hilarious because yesterday I was in bed with 102 fever. Paul doesn't even know this. I was sicker than I've been in so long, but you guys know me. I mean, my job is to hack health and, and wellness and illness. And I think I hacked it because I feel back to 100% today. And hopefully I don't look too um, post illness. Um, but I'm, I'm so happy to be there. I, I just say that because I literally, I, you guys have seen me every week come on here with different incredible um, guests, but today's is really special. And Paul is someone who didn't even know it, but he helped me in a really difficult time. And I want to share just a little bit of that story, and then we'll get to hearing him and hearing from him on the tips and things that he has on toxic relationships, how to identify if you're in one and how to have healthy boundaries. I found that so many men and women and especially professional women in my sphere, um, like me, they have a profession, they have things together in many realms of their life, uh, but then they find in relationships, they are maybe choosing poorly choosing or having some old trauma patterns or messages that allow them to be in a space that's really really unhealthy. So this is the Dr. Jill live part of me that you may or may not have ever heard, but I'm going to share very um, intimately and um, authentically with you today on some of those fronts. So just a little background, you can get all of my um, videos on YouTube on my channel, Jill Carnahan, and you can um, watch these on Facebook. They'll be recorded. So feel free to check back anytime. If you have anything you want to um, look up on the website, it's just jillcarnahan.com. So let me introduce my guest and um, then we'll get to talking. So Paul is a behavioral and relationship coach, uh, coach and hosts two podcasts, The Overwhelmed Brain and Love and Abuse. And those are the two where I found him and found, like I said, I'll share just a little bit of my journey. He's been teaching emotional intelligence and critical decision-making for the past 10 years and is the creator of several books and programs for those looking to overcome difficulties in their lives in relationships. He re resides in Atlanta, Georgia with his girlfriend, Asha. So uh, Paul, I am just so delighted to have you on and I, I can get to my bit of a story in a minute, but I'd love to start with you and tell me, how did you get into this work? This It's kind of a calling if it's like anything like my life, <laughs> we don't choose really necessarily, but tell me, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into this. It's great to be here. Thank you, Dr. Jill. And I'm so glad that you are well now. And uh, I think your past of recovering from all the stuff that you went through, I read, I read your about page uh, and changing your diet and changing your habits and changing and exercising and just being healthy allows you to bounce back so quickly mm -hmm. from 102 fever. So I'm so glad that you bounced back. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I got started probably about 15 years ago studying hypnosis and brain sciences and something called neuro-linguistic programming, which half the world knows and the other half Love NLP. <laughs> <laughs> and so I started researching all that and it all stemmed from a girlfriend who told me you should be a hypnotist. So one day I, I read about all that stuff and then I studied for years and years and I finally decided to get certified in NLP and hypnosis and becoming a coach. And that was like, uh, that was just over 10 years ago. And I, I, you know, I still needed to make money. I wasn't doing coaching. So I was in technology sector for a long time and I was working in regular corporate job type jobs. And um, I felt like, or I, 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 I could tell that people kept asking me questions and I could help them when they'd ask me these questions. And I would always be the guy that stayed after five and talked to somebody for the next two hours while we went through some personal challenges of theirs. And I decided, you know, this is something that I, I seem to be able to help people through. So from that point on, I started transitioning from my regular nine to five job into more coaching and really picking things up and really studying harder and harder to get to that point uh, where I felt like I could be helpful. To, I mean, there's a whole background I could probably get into. I, I started the hypnosis practice and I failed at that because I was I so self-conscious and I moved past that and I moved through it. And I felt when I finally got to that point where I could feel I could help others, that's when I transitioned. I love it. And you're helping so many people with your podcast. Like I said, we're going to uh, link the, up to those and make sure that I encourage you guys to listen and check those out because they were a game changer for me, Paul. And 
I suspect, like I said, I don't know your personal type or any of that, but I suspect you're actually more of an introvert that's really, really intuitive and perceptive and sensitive like I am. And we go out in the world because that's where we actually can teach and train and, and help people. But it's funny because those gifts are actually, they're more of a like behind the scenes. We're just very usually perceptive about the environment and observational. Would you say that's true about you? <laughs> I could call myself a super introvert. At the same time, I'm comfortable being an extrovert and the life of the party, not really life of party, but I like being the life of the party. I'm not, I'm not usually the life of the party, <laughs> but I like getting the attention when people laugh and things like that. But I, I really feel so comfortable being introverted. Um, I, I don't know if I'm even allowed to call myself sensitive or anything like that, but I do feel like uh, this is how I look at introversion. When you're an introvert, when you're ready to recharge, you just need to unplug from yeah. everyone and everything. I like to sit in nature. I like to be in nature. I like to play my guitar. You could probably see it behind me, maybe. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I'm in that space, I feel like I'm recharging. So, uh, and I love the grounding feeling of taking my introverted nature wherever I want and being happy wherever I am happy in in general but no not all the time but yeah. when i need to recharge and unplug and feel better that's what i like to do is go into that introverted or grounded space i think i that, love that and uh, i get it because it's funny for years i thought i was an introvert i was going to be a librarian before i was going to be a physician because <laughs> i love books but then i realized like this is actually you you hit the nail on the head it's actually more of a highly sensitive trait it's 10% of the population. And those of us who are in that realm, we just really observe details and we see patterns and people and, uh, you know, NLP and all these different things that we do. And then we make sense of it and teach other people. And I, I used to be what I thought was an introvert. I'm kind of like you, I can be on a stage. I can be in front of people. I love it. It's just that recharging. And it's that perceptive ability that I know that you have, because you wouldn't be doing what you do without that ability to really see the nuances of human behavior and, and interactions. It's interesting that you say that if I don't, if you don't mind me interrupting, um, because I think I learned how to be more perceptive by being an introvert. I think I learned how to observe people because, and maybe this works. I haven't even thought about this. I, I, I believe that the more you go through, not so much trauma, but maybe trauma when you're a child, you seem to bring yourself back into yourself. So you pull yourself in. And maybe the less you go through, you're not so introverted. This is just a total hypothesis, hypothesis right now. But when you're always inside, then you're observing from that inside place. And so I grew up asking myself, uh, what would I do in that situation? I wonder what they're thinking. I wonder what they think of me. All these questions that keep coming up. And I think that has helped me become more perceptive. And a lot of people that had gone through any type of dysfunctional upbringing or an upbringing where they just wanted to be left alone because there's so many people bothering them or hurting them even. And so I think that helps people gain intuition and become more sensitive to the environment and people around them. I could not agree more because I've seen that pattern of like, um, like say you had an abusive stepfather and every single time he comes in the door, you're cringing because you have to judge by his eye contact no eye contact, his mood, his actions, the littlest nuances, you have to judge if it's safe or not. And when it regards your, your own safety, you're going to become really observant to those clues of human behavior and action and um, in, inflection of tone and things, because that's going to determine. And when you're young and you have to do that, you become really, really good at watching people and observing behaviors and reading them, right? You just described my childhood. I mean, exactly the same. <laughs> wow. <laughs> The abusive alcoholic stepfather. I could not. Uh, I did not know that, Paul. I didn't mean to put <laughs> on the spot at all. <laughs> that's okay. I mean, this is the, the perfect segue yeah. into wow. my child. No. Uh, no, but that's exactly what happened. Uh, you know, he, I did not want to see him. I hoped he never came into my room. I could hear him yelling and screaming at my mom. And, uh, you know, yeah. I, I always tell my past with an understanding that a lot of other people's past are a lot worse. Mm -hmm. I never received any physical abuse, but the fear was always there and the fear is real and you're going through it. And, you, and yes, you're right. You, you just have all these thoughts about let's hope this doesn't happen. And 
and being, al- I've, I've, I've learned that being alone is a very safe place. Yes. <laughs> and well, so that's probably where it came from. Well, thanks for sharing that. Cause again, from as, as you who are listening, if you get on here, Paul's podcast, like I did, it's um, so powerful because you are incredibly perceptive about human behavior and actually bringing that to an understanding. Mm-hmm. I have studied for my whole entire life, um, human behavior under like my greatest goal. I love the functional medicine piece, but what I love even more is understanding why people do what they do, how to motivate people to change behaviors, how to be in a relationship that's super healthy. And I'll tell you, we'll go to my story just for a moment. And then I want to hear your comments. I want to talk about abuse and all that. Um, so let's see where to start. Well, first thing is, is I'm working on a book right now. If I'd write it in like two sentences, it's kind of like, okay, I think I want to read that book because when I was 40, my ex-husband came home around my 40th birthday and said, I don't love you anymore. I want to be with another woman, total shock and blew up my happy bubble. No inclination prior to that of any problem. And that was the beautiful thing about it was I was sleepwalking in those first um, decades, it was almost two, two decades of marriage and didn't really understand who I was or what I was in relation to this relationship. And so it was the best thing that ever happened to me because I was forced to all of a sudden find my own identity, say what happened here and not point fingers because I could do that, but to say what part of me either showed up, didn't show up. How was I in this relationship? What happened, right? And so I did the deep, deep, deep work around that. But shortly after, um, the, during the separation, right before the divorce, I met a man and I was so naive. Like I met my ex-husband at 19, married at 21. So that's all I had known. And I'm like a happy bubble kind of person. who's very naive in that sense. And this was a manipulator abuser. He was, a uh, later on found bipolar and borderline, um, very, of course, loving and, uh, you know, bringing those things in it, it reflected on part of me that felt like I wasn't worthy of love and, um, not enough and all those things, because I had just gotten out of what I, you know, who am I and why did this person leave me? And am I not lovable? And the bottom line is after it became physically abusive, I filed a restraining order, which in and of itself was shocking and very different for me to set a boundary. And within two days of that restraining order, he committed suicide. Oh, so oh, yeah, this deal with that too. who know me, haven't heard this part of me yet either. And that would, if that wouldn't have been enough, that would have been a great story. The next six months I got involved with an ex-felon alcoholic and he became very emotionally abusive. And that's when I found some of your information and it was so profound. I remember trying to make a decision. And the thing that I want you to talk to the listeners about is the confusion that manifests in these relationships, because here I am. And this is why I wanted to talk about this. I have a successful practice. I have a, you know, great presence on the internet. I love to teach and love to, and I, I, think I bring joy and happiness and I have great friendships. Like my life is so beautiful. And yet with the past, with the men that I chose to be in relationship with, it was so freaking dysfunctional. (laughs) And, and so you would think like looking at me, Oh, Jill has it all together. She has it, but I didn't. And I, I want today to speak to those of you women out there that might have a lot of areas of your life together, but in this area, there's still some childhood wounding around your value, your self-worth, your boundaries that allows you to be in stuff that's so dysfunctional. And I remember driving on the road after a dental appointment and I was so overwhelmed. I had to make a decision that I knew would really, I, I had basically broken up with this last toxic relationship, but there was still that stickiness. And we can talk about that. And it was all manipulation. I didn't understand that. I didn't know why did I feel so bad about myself, which you talk about. Why did I feel so entangled? Like, why couldn't I get out of this? Like I knew in my head, I had written pages and pages and pages. I had done workshops. I had understood at an analytical level why this was bad for me. But on the emotional heart level, there was a stickiness and it was that emotional abuse component. And I'm driving down the road and like almost in tears, like I need to make a decision. What is wrong with me? And I just, I'm like, maybe there's some podcast that can help me (laughs) and I'm flipping through and there's millions of podcasts out there. I don't know how it happened except by divine intervention. I see the overwhelmed brain. I thought, well, that's very appropriate (laughs) because I'm super analytical. So I'm always in my head. Like I can figure anything out in my head. I'm an engineer background. I do, you know, medical mysteries for a, for a living. I love to figure things out, but in this relational level, I I could cry. I couldn't figure it out. I was stuck. 
And I was completely stuck because of what is wrong and why can I know this is not good for me and yet be so stuck. And I listened to, I don't know what episode it was, but I was glued and mesmerized because I felt like you were talking to me about, and the two things I remember from that podcast were um, choose empowerment over fear or choose empowerment. Or, yeah, I think it was empowerment over fear. I think that might've been the title of the podcast and you were talking about how um, any choice, it might be really difficult in that time. But if you choose empowerment over fear, even the person that you're setting a boundary with, it's going to be better for both of you in the end, right? And the other thing that I heard from someone else was always choose expansion over contraction. So at the heart level, I knew, okay, that's easy. I know my choice. And I made a choice after that, that was totally blew apart that toxic relationship. And it was the best thing I ever did. Um, but that was from literally from like everything changed after that. And then I went that this is, you're going to love this. That weekend, I found your other podcast, Love and Abuse. Oh, no. I think I spent like eight hours a day for three days listening to every episode. <laughs> I was like, this is amazing. And I wrote notes and I got your workbook because for me to understand, I'm this kind, conscientious trying to make, I tried to make it right, you know, try to make it work. And then to realize, oh, this is emotional abuse. I didn't understand that. So, that's why I want to frame that. I'd love to let you comment on some of that, but thank you. Yeah. for This is why it's so important for me to share what you've done for me publicly because it was profound. Well, I'm so glad you shared that story because other people need to hear this because they're in your <laughs> shoes now, or they were, and they still don't understand it. Uh, you probably spent a long time looking for closure. Mm -hmm. Like, what did I do wrong? What could I have done better? What should I have done? Uh, you mentioned, I mean, everything you mentioned is very packed. We could just, I know, right? like we have no dearth of what to talk about. <laughs> no. Well, one of the things that really stood out was he was very loving mm -hmm. and you, you went past it really quick, but there's an important part there. A lot of them are loving at first, very loving. It's called love bombing, gift bombing. Yes. Uh, they're just showering you with love and they will feel like your soulmate they will feel like this is the perfect person to me. I don't know if that you went through that, but it's, I felt like, like I was seen for the first time. And like, I've been oh, in yeah. places where I had to be like Dr. Jill or on stage Jill, or my hair was all. And I felt like in that I could be myself so truly and be seen and be loved no matter what shape or state I was in. And that was really hard to understand that, you know, no, that's, that's a great way to put it. Um, I don't really think about it that way too often, but you're right. And it is, it's almost like they're fully non-judgmental and fully accepting. And you just feel like you could be your vulnerable self with them. And what that is, is they're unlocking the secrets that you keep so they can use those against you. And yes. you ask, you know, how, how does somebody who is kind to people? And I mean, you didn't say these words, but they're, they're, they're happy and they're kind and they're doing everything they can to be just go out there and be themselves and suddenly they attract this, you didn't say it, but monster sometimes, they could be a real monster. Uh, I think what ends up happening is that a lot of our compassion, our kindness, our caring, our supportive nature is used against us by people like that. It's just true. There's, there's people out there in the world just like that. There are many ways to recognize them. One of them you've already mentioned which is the love bombing when everything is moving so quick, you feel so good with this person. It doesn't mean it's going to be a bad thing. It just means you got to keep your radar on. You got to go, whoa, this is really moving fast. This is moving really fast. I love it. I hope it continues to move that fast. But you know what? I've got this little watchdog up here and I'm going to just keep that watchdog on guard all the time because at the first sign that something's weird, some sort of what my girlfriend calls a glitch. Mm -hmm. At the first sign of a glitch, I need to ask myself questions about it instead of going into the benefit of the doubt mode. And you might have done that, like when things started happening. I'm just guessing at what your relationship was like. When things started happening, you might have thought, well, maybe he was having a bad day. Maybe uh, there was something I said and I didn't come out right. Maybe I miscommunicated all these maybes, but, you know, let's step out of that and, and look at what exactly happened. And, and, you know, I, like I said, there's a million things to unpack with, about what you said, but 
Um, I really do think it's important when things start moving fast and they feel really good. We have to keep our radar on and still enjoy it. And you can do both. Yeah, I did that. I did that for a year in this relationship I'm in now because I became so aware of my boundaries. Mm -hmm. I became so aware of what I wanted for myself in my life and what I will and won't accept, just like the relationship boundaries that you're talking about. When you are aware of what you will accept and won't accept in your life, it's always good to always have that watchdog or radar or whatever you want to call it in the background running so that when things start happening, and we can talk about those things, then we, then we can start questioning what's really happening here. Um, and this does involve, like you were talking about, maybe there was some naivete inside you where you felt, you tell me if you felt maybe a little gullible to this because you were just trusting. I, and oh, it's you, huge, Paul. I'm the biggest, like I could take a, well, I did take a felon and find the good in their heart and then like make excuses because I'm like, oh, well, they had childhood trauma. They just need love. Yes. So I'm totally that person. But then again, it got to be, and like what you just said, within eight weeks, he proposed. I mean, that should have been a red flag. Oh, okay. Right. And then later the love bombing, I got one day to my office, like 10 bouquets of flowers from Hawaii. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. But my night, I'm not quite so naive anymore. But at the time I was just like, oh, this is lovely. It fits into Jill's disneyland but that's the problem right? <laughs> well you know they they people like that will discover a lot about you at the very beginning they want to know all about you you know tell me everything and of course that feels wonderful you want to talk about yourself because you feel like you're being accepted you feel like you're being listened to and understood and it's so hard emotional abuse is so hard to define sometimes because it's a mixture of everything that you want and everything you hope is real and good uh, with a little deception and manipulate or a lot of manipulation that has an agenda behind it. So I, I like to look at that. Okay. Is it moving too fast? Okay. If it's, if it's moving too fast, we're falling in love really quick. Let's slow things down because what the emotionally abusive person, a lot of them aren't going to like is the fact that they're not getting their way fast enough. And, if it's slowing down and you're saying, no, we're going to wait on this. No, we're not going to move in together yet. This is what I want. They're going to sense that confidence in you knowing what you want. And it's going to be troublesome to them. And then some behaviors will, will start to come out and oh, you just, you know, you just don't really love me. You say you love me, but you, you don't even want to move in together. Oh, okay. You're starting to make me feel bad. You're starting to make me feel guilty. And I can go down a laundry list of all the things that you'll feel. But as soon as you start feeling bad in the relationship and they don't necessarily care that you're feeling bad. And then I go one step further. As soon as, soon as you start feeling bad about yourself in the relationship and they don't seem to care that you feel bad about yourself, we have an issue. We have a challenge that we need to talk about and get through. I loved how you said that over and over, because that's the thing I wouldn't, I would never have equated with emotional abuse but you brought it really simply. And like I said, I think I've heard every episode of that <laughs> the second podcast, but it was always clear. Like if you feel bad about yourself in a relationship yeah. and the other person doesn't care, and maybe you can phrase it better, but like, that's the heart of emotional abuse. It doesn't have to be specific. And then the other thing you said that I found myself because I would kept pushing boundaries. Like I knew for probably nine months that I should be out of this. So I kept pushing, pushing, pushing. I would spend less time. I would break up. I would do all these things to give distance. Um, but I would still be in that cycle of feeling bad about myself and, um, in that stickiness. And you, again, I'd love for you to kind of go over it. Like if someone's listening, like, well, how do I know if I'm in an emotionally abusive relationship? What would you tell them? Well, we start off there. You know, if you're starting to feel bad in the relationship, I think that's something important to talk about. Like, you know, when we have a conversation, honey, I always feel like, I don't know. I, I just feel like I'm, I'm worthless. I feel like I'm worthless after we have these conversations. I mean, this is an honest, vulnerable. I mean, now you're being honest and vulnerable when you say stuff like this, mm -hmm. which if you feel fear about being vulnerable with the person that you're with, there's a sign right there. I mean, you shouldn't have to have that fear. The person that you're with, the person you're sharing your life with or some time with should be the, the bis biggest person in the world that you can trust. That should be the most trust and the most safe that you feel. And so when that starts to disintegrate, because it, you know, it started off with trust and love and respect, and you felt all of that stuff, when that starts to disintegrate, 
Um, this is typically what happens is that you will start to feel like it's your fault because it was there before. And so you start taking the blame, you start taking responsibility for all the problems in the relationship. You start feeling more and more guilty. You start feeling just down and uh, sad and down about yourself. And you really feel like it's your fault. Um, the guilt is a big one. When you start feeling guilty about things that are happening, like, uh, you know, I, I moved his or her uh, food or I moved his or her beer or whatever. And uh, they got up, they got so upset. They were so angry. It's like, whoa, it, this really doesn't justify that behavior doesn't justify what just happened. So you start seeing these things and you realize, okay, when these things happen, they are all components of something bigger. You know, once we see behavior that we don't like, that behavior is in there. It is part of them. We can't just throw it away and say, well, maybe they were having a bad day. No, no, that's part of them. So we have to understand that that's in there. Now, when does it come out and what is it? What is its purpose? Are they just upset? And they go, oh, my, I hate when people move my beer. That's different than saying, I hate when you move my beer and do things that make me angry. Now they're making you feel bad instead of instead of like highlighting something that they're dealing with and they've always dealt with in their life. No, it's about making it about you. So I really think it's important to learn to listen, to find out if it's really about you mm -hmm. personally, yeah. instead of something that they're dealing with. Because a lot of us have childhood trauma. A lot of us have been through a lot of dysfunction. And of course, we're going to have our own sob stories, our own victim stories, and we'll bring them into the relationship. And we want our partner to feel, you know, something for us. Oh my God, you went through that. I'm so sorry you went through that. You know, that's great. We can connect and communicate. But when we use that story as a, as a way or as a means to make you feel bad about yourself or to have power over you and take your power away, suddenly it's not what it really is supposed to be, which is, hey, that was a really sad story. I'm here if you need me. Oh, thank you so much. It's not that at all. It's more of, hey, you know what? I'm the victim here. This is the emotional abuser talking. I'm the victim here. Uh, so why are you doing this to me? And they'll just turn it around. So the biggest challenge with emotional abuse is that each behavior is a tiny component of something bigger, which is why it's so hard to explain to friends and family that so-and-so did this and they're going to look at you and say, well, that doesn't sound so bad. And you're going to say, no, it happens all the time. Well, yeah, but, and then you'll have this conversation that won't go anywhere because they're not going to see it as abusive behavior, but that I look, I look at it as like a drip feed, like they're constantly drip feeding you this bad behavior and this manipulation and this, maybe the lies and the deception and it feels like that Chinese water torture. It's just yes. in your head constantly and you just can't stand it. And you, you get to that and erosion. It's subtle, and it's also mixed with the loving kindness that can come too. So it's very deceptive. One thing yeah. I thought of as you were talking, that was my biggest aha moment was um, I was always defending myself, like always, yes. always defending myself. And especially if we have any extended time, which actually for a long time limited our time because it would be so exhausting. It'd be like a two or three hour conversation where I might bring one little thing up that I wanted to talk about or get worked on, you know, through a, our relationship. And then it would turn into an attack on me. And because when I learned, oh, wait, I don't have to defend myself. That was the first part of my freedom. Because before that, I was like, oh, someone's attacking my character and my integrity. I have to say that, no, I wouldn't mean to hurt you. I didn't mean, you know, I like, I wanted to defend, not defend against anything evil, just say, no, my intention wasn't to hurt you. And, but then it'd go on for hours. And again, you know this so well, when I got out of that relationship, all of a sudden I had 10 times the energy back because it was so draining to have these three hour phone calls. And then I was defending myself for three hours. <laughs> you, yeah. I mean, that. have you heard the episode called the turnaround game in my love and abuse? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I think That's so. exactly the whole episode. I'm talking about that where all they do is no matter what you bring up, Hey, you know, when you said that, you know, you being the person receiving the emotional boost. And when you said that it kind of felt disrespectful. Could you not say it so harshly next time? I'm being disrespectful. Yes. What about you when you did this and you caused this and, and suddenly you're going, uh, because you're a nice person and you don't want to be seen as a bad person, you're going to defend yourself. You're going to say, no, no, that's not what I meant at all. 
I, I, you know, this is what I meant. And they're going to keep you busy defending yourself. And that takes your, that is a powerless position. Oh, it was talking. huge. The moment I real, and again, that was from probably that episode. I was like, mm-hmm. oh, wait. And there's another book, uh, Edith Eager called The Gift. She's a Holocaust survivor. Also talks a little bit about this. Such a great, but both of those things, it was like, oh, wait, the moment I said, I don't have to defend myself anymore. And I would hear this. And I, and I literally might even say, you know what? I don't have to defend myself against that. That's not true. And it would like, there's nowhere to go. And it was amazing the power that I had when I stopped defending myself. <laughs> That's wonderful. That that reminds me of a, a quick story of my girlfriend. I mean, even healthy relationships. I believe I have a healthy relationship. Even healthy relationships have arguments. You get mad at each other sometimes. And it can, it can be screaming mad sometimes. Thankfully, not a lot for me. Uh, but there was one time when she said, well, you're just being stupid. You're some, something like an idiot or stupid. Yeah. And she was like serious. And I just kind of chuckled. And uh, she said, why are you laughing? I just called you stupid. And I said, well, I guess I would be offended if I believed that. Yeah. And she laughed. And then we just ended <laughs> the conversation. But that made me think that we if, if you're offended, if you're hurt, then it's at some deep level, you must believe some part of what they're saying about you. And we often do that because we're with somebody that we think we can trust. So we put all this trust in someone that turns out to be deceptive or manipulative or controlling. And so when they say something, we believe it. And then we take it in and we think, oh, that is a part of me. What? Oh, I need to fix that. I need to heal from that. And so I like to um, I like to understand who I am at the deepest level. If you can, before you get into a relationship, know yourself. Am I a nice person? Am I respectful? Am I kind? Am I honest? Do I have, um, do I have integrity? And I know myself so well. So when I get into a relationship, and you can do this while you're in a relationship, yeah. know yourself well, because who were you before that relationship? Know yourself well enough so that when something comes your way and they say, well, you're just a liar. No, I'm. I'm not a liar. I know myself well enough. So I'm not going to have to, I don't have to defend myself. So I'm glad you brought up defending yourself because they, they want to keep you busy doing something, doing something that has no power. Defending yourself is doing something you have no power, uh, making you feel guilty, making you feel bad. All of this stuff is a low power place. Mm-hmm. And as long as you're there, they're on top. It's sometimes called the power over model. Oh, yeah. I have power over you therefore as long as you're in this space because if if, you know then i'm then i'm ahead or i'm above you but if you rise above and say no i I don't believe that i'm not going to take that behavior anymore i i I won't i I won't accept that behavior anymore then they're going to get a little scared because now their method of control which is probably mostly survival mechanism for them is being taken away and they'll probably pull out some more bag of tricks to see how far they can push you and keep you down. I love that. And what I learned too, is all of this, it's for me, it's always this journey of like, what's my part in this? Because I can point fingers all day long and, but I still have the power to change myself or to get out of the situation. And so even if you're listening here, there's, so for me, what it was, you know, they've said that all root of, you know, sadness or dysfunction comes with feeling unlovable, unworthy, or helpless. And you've listed in your uh, guide, other things that indicate level count. You, you mentioned this is straight from your uh, mean workbook, which we'll be sure and let people um, have a link to that as well. If they want to purchase, it's very worth, very worth it. Great resource. But you talked about confidence, stability, security, self-trust, self-love, self-compassion, and decisiveness. And I remember like, this is funny story, but it's a huge thing. One of the game changers of getting out of that relationship was fixing my own garage. Like how silly is that? But I had, I felt like I'm, I'm confident in, you know, treating patients and all that and mechanical things. No. Um, so to have, you know, someone in my life that could like take care of the fixing the garage, fixing with those kinds of mechanical things felt really good. Cause in those ways, I maybe felt a little helpless. And then one, one day I remember so specifically my garage door was broken and I figured out what to do. I did it myself and it was so freaking empowering. I'm like, I freaking fixed my own garage door. <laughs> 
but it was one of those things where like, I didn't feel helpless and helpless was how he had kind of got a little bit of control over me because I felt like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do if something breaks? I can't fix it. But that's just, not true. <laughs> yeah, you just mentioned that part of the workbook where I talk about becoming yeah. self-reliant in all those areas of your life financially. Um, just, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of areas in our lives that we tep- typically have a dependency of someone else, or not typically, but often mm-hmm. have a a dependency on someone else for, and rightly so. I mean, when you get into a relationship and you get a house and you have kids and or, or wherever you go with it, you're going to have to share responsibilities. So it makes sense to have these dependencies. But the problem is when somebody becomes controlling and has power over you and, and now it's becoming a bad situation, if you're not reliant enough on your own or can't figure out how to do it, it's going to be very difficult, which is why in the workbook and other places I talk about, you, you need to build these levels of confidence. And you mentioned one at the end, decisiveness. Mm-hmm. There's so many people that I talk to that, that tell me that they just can't decide. They can't, they don't trust themselves. They don't know what to do next. And I have episodes in the overwhelmed brain on decision-making definitely listen to those. Um, but when you get to the point where you just make a decision and just go for it, whether you're going to fail or not, at least you've made the decision, at least you're taking a step forward. If you fail, you get back up, you dust yourself off and say, I'll never do that again. And then you move to the next one. And you just keep moving forward. So I really like that you brought up those levels, because the I think in the, the book, it shows like a graph where yeah. if if you're low in this, if you're low in confidence, then they're above you here. And if you're low here, and so getting uh this is all about self-help. I mean, or going to ter- therapy or coaching or whatever you do, getting the help you need, reading the resources, watching the resources that you need to build yourself up. I like to look at it as you want to bring the best, healthiest version of you into a relationship. So when the re- if the relationship starts to go bad, that you feel good enough in yourself to say whatever you need to say, even at the risk of losing the relationship, because it's that important to you to be in that space, because they're not going to take your power away. You already have it when you bring it in. And I think a lot of people that may be listening or watching right now, they're already in the relationship. They already feel powerless. They already feel like, what do I do now? You just start, you just start working on yourself. If you are if you fear something, then you move toward that and you start working on what you fear and figure out why you're afraid of it. What's going to happen? What's the worst case scenario? There's all kinds of little processes I talk about, like worst case scenario. How, how much worse can it get than that? How much worse can it get than that? You try those on and then you realize, oh, I guess I could probably survive that. Hey, I made it through. And once you make it through, your confidence goes up. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I'd love to talk about like, just like you said, it's a few specific, so say we're talking to people who are in something like this and like, well, what do I do? Um, I know for me, there was a a point that was really clear where it was self-trust and self-love and how that played out is if I, if I would have trusted myself from probably the very beginning of that relationship, I knew intuitively there was something not right, but I overrode that sense of trust because like, oh, that must be just, you know, me thinking the worst, or that must be just, oh my gosh, that, you know, poor thing, he had trauma. Um, If I would have trusted myself and trusted my intuition to know this was not right, I would have been out of that a lot sooner. So the self-trust. And then, like you said, the self-love is, and it's funny because I come from a background of like almost too much humility where it's so it'd be horrible to say oh my gosh I love myself so I I swung the other way but then in that I lost the sense of like no I'm worthy of love and respect and kindness and I'm going to show that too so there's no problem with believing that I'm worthy of that because I'm going to give it just in fact when I there was a little icon that I gravitated towards my own and it was I want to be the queen of grace and truth. And I want to show up in the world with love and compassion. And I want to give and receive the love that I want in my life. So it was like this whole um, thing that I wrote out that really helped me to embody. I want to show up in the world this way because that's what I want to receive, but I'm going to give it just the same. And that is all about self-love. That's wonderful. It's all self-nurturing behavior. And I love that you've created a philosophy or a mantra or whatever you want to call that. And it almost acts as your home base. Like if anything ever happens, I'm going to write back to that. And I'm going to say this. And is this what I'm receiving in my life? Is this what I'm getting? 
I, it reminds me of um, a question that I ask people to ask their partners or their emotionally abusive person in their life, um, which is when you, when you think there's, I mean, well, let, let me back up. There's one thing that you said that has to do with um, when things start going bad, maybe there's a way to uh, address it when it comes up. And I think this does lead to my question. The question that I like to ask people is when some bad behavior happens or you're not sure about the behavior, because you were saying, you know, you're, you trust your instincts, you trust what's going on. Because if it's, if it's strange to you, it's probably something going on. So maybe you witness some sort of bad behavior. Maybe you're experiencing it. I like to have people or victims of emotional abuse ask the question, um, do you realize that what you did or said hurt me? I, I think that's a very mm -hmm. great opening, safe opening question. Do you realize that what you just did or said, whatever it is, hurt me? Because it, it offers them an opportunity to have an empowered answer. It gives them an opportunity to show up as a knight in shining armor or a big jerk. <laughs> and uh, when, when they answer it, you're going to know a lot. Well, okay. Most likely, most of the time, they'll probably say, well, no, or they'll say, I, I'm not trying to hurt you. Or, uh, you know, what you're not getting hurt. They're going to invalidate you right away. You're not feeling hurt. Well, I am. And I just wanted to know, you know, just keep it, keep it on topic, keep it on the subject. Your question has to be answered. Do you realize that what you just said hurt me? Mm -hmm. Well, no. You know, let's just say they say no. Mm -hmm. The next question, the follow-up question uh, is, well, now that you know, will you please stop? Mm -hmm. I think that's another fair, yeah. safe, fair question. Mm -hmm. If they say, well, uh, you know, you're hurting me too. They're going to try to change it, try to turn it around. That may be true. There's another follow-up. You know what? That may be true. I, I may be hurting you as well. And I think we should talk about that. But I just want to know bring it back right back to the question. Now that you know, will you stop? So what you're doing is continuing to focus on what you want to know the answer to and also what they're promising their behavior is going to be from this point forward. Mm -hmm. Now, I did have somebody write to me and say, um, I asked that question. Yeah. I asked that question to my partner, because he was doing some really ridiculous things. And uh, she said, Okay, do you realize what you said hurt me? And he said, Yes. And she said, well, well, why are you doing it? And he said, well, because uh, it's fun. She said, I left the next day. <laughs> yeah, tells you a lot. Wow. <laughs> I was wow. like, wow. <laughs> oh, it <laughs> is, because either way, you're going to get truth. And <laughs> you, you do have to kind of understand that this will lead to truth. And uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to expand on another thing that you said about the intuition and, and understanding uh, that maybe your instincts are right they almost always are about something that's going on because if you're in a healthy, a good, healthy relationship, you're probably not going to carry around some deep emotional trigger about what they're going to say or do. Mm -hmm. But if you are carrying that around, then something's going on. So this might be a place that a lot of people are confused. Like, I don't know what's going on. There's something happening. This is why I do my show, Love and Abuse. This is why I do my show, The Overwhelmed Brand. This is why I create the workbooks and the content. You can find out all about all the signals, all the, the signs and everything from what I talk about. But I, I really do think it comes back to learning to say, okay, I'm feeling something is not right here. Because relationships are supposed to be fun. They're supposed to be a little bit easier than emotionally abusive relationships. You're supposed to have maybe some conflict every now and then, but it gets resolved. You actually talk about it and talk through it. It may come up again, but then I, I could give you a personal story. My girlfriend, and I just resolved something that happened months ago. Um, didn't know the anger was still in there, but it was in there, uh, mostly in her. And then it came to me. <laughs> and then, uh, we talked about it and we finally reached an understanding that was based on a misunderstanding. But this is what a healthy relationship should go through. It should go through the trials and tribulations, the ups and downs until you reach that uh, some sort of closure. But you, if it's anything lingering, if you've got, you got something lingering and you're carrying it around and you just don't want to talk about that subject anymore and you don't want to bring that thing up in, again and you hope that he or she doesn't do this, 
then you've got something else that's a little bit deeper. And you should really consider that your instincts are right and what you're thinking has some validity to it. Mm -hmm. So don't not trust yourself. Follow through because either way, you're going to win. If yeah. you find out that there is something manipulation, deception, control, emotional abuse, if any of that's going on, then you've learned something that will help you make your next decision. Or if you learn some, or, or if you find out that none of that's going on, it was a complete misunderstanding from point one, you still win because now you don't have to worry about it anymore. You can get some closure. So I like to look at it that way. You just have to investigate inside your own relationship to understand what's happening. Be that analytical person like you are and really break things down to understand what's happening. I love that you're saying that. And it's funny because I've learned it all my life. My first, my marriage, the long-term relationship, it wasn't bad, but I was a conflict avoider. And I love hearing like Brittany Brown says, uh, clear is kind. And she talks about it as with boundaries and confrontation. And that's helped me so much refrain because when I set a boundary or when I say something that feels conflictual, it feels like it's unkind. But when I think about, wait, no, no, no giving them the truth and love in, in a kind way is actually clear as kind. Like that's helped me. And then Edith Eager said, you know what, if you have a relationship and you have no conflict, you don't have intimacy. I was like, Oh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's a big one. Because again, like and my ex-husband and I are friends now, he would probably say the same thing. We had a lot of fun and we had no conflict. And I don't know if we had true intimacy, like it wasn't a bad relationship, but I think it was on such a superficial level. And we both weren't quite willing to do the work to go because he avoided pain. I avoided conflict. And so we just had fun and we avoided all those topics. And then at the end, when things, you know, started to get rough and we didn't even know it, we didn't know that we didn't have the depth to support the things that come in life. So now I understand in hindsight, but you're so right about that because conflict is not a bad thing being clear with bound. Let's talk a little bit about boundaries in the last few minutes. How do you approach, especially for someone like me, who's terrified of, um, you know, being in conflict and doesn't like to um, have any of those difficult conversations I've learned. So I'm much better, but talk, tell us more about the importance of boundaries, how to approach boundaries, a little bit about boundary work. <clears throat> Probably one of my favorite subjects, because like you, conflict avoidance, almost all my life. I mean, most of my life, I, I was afraid to ask for raises. I was afraid to <laughs> tell my partner that they're being mean. I was, I, I, no matter what it was, I didn't want to make waves. I learned that from my mom who did not want to make waves with her alcoholic husband, um, you know, abusive <laughs> husband. And so I learned that it was easier to make people laugh. It was easier to get along. It was easier to just be the neutral, the balancer, all of that stuff, because it just seemed like it avoided conflict. The problem when you avoid conflict is it builds up in the background mm -hmm. and every friendship that you have starts to get burnt out. Every relationship, every job you have, I mean, this would happen in my life. Everything started to burn me out because I never spoke what was on my mind. And I remember when I first realized how much I was getting walked on and walked over and how, I mean, there's a point in your life where you look at your past and you say, why am I, or ask yourself, why am I losing all these relationships? Why do I get burnt out so quickly? And so you start to break down what happened and you go, well, when my friend said this to me and I said, well, of course, you know, I'll help you move. Yeah. Oh, you've got a sleeper couch on the third floor. That sounds like fun. I'll do it with you. When I really wanted to say, no, hell no, I don't, I don't want to go near that. That's a, that's a, a 300 pound couch. But, uh, I decided that it was important for me to start practicing no, start practicing boundaries. And so I remember the, I've told the story on my show. I remember the first time that I practiced a boundary and it was very difficult. My, I had two bosses, they were talking to me about another employee and they were saying, oh, Mike does this and Mike did that. And he, he's not good at this and he's not good at that. And I was thinking, wow, Mike's not even here to defend himself. Mm -hmm. So my old self would be like, oh, I've ever not say anything. You know, this is whatever's going on with him. But my new self was thinking, okay, I got to practice this. What's going to happen? Because we fear practicing or honoring ourselves because we're, we're afraid of the consequences. Mm -hmm. So I kind of came up with a little question in my mind that said, what would I do or say if I had no fear of the consequences? What would I do or say if I had no fear of the consequences? So I, I sat in that for just a moment while they were talking. And I finally said, you know, you guys are talking about Mike. He's not even here to defend himself. And I just don't think that's fair. Oh, good for you. My God, my, 
I swallowed and I just <laughs> waited. It was so, I was so afraid. I was just waiting for it to be fired. I was just waiting for it. But this, this was it. This was my practice. And they both stopped and they were kind of like, what's going on here? They just kind of interrupted their pattern. And what came out of the mouth was totally unexpected. They said, you know what? That's exactly what we need to hear. This is exactly the kind of feedback that we need, wow. uh, you know? And it just turned into a productive conversation. And then shortly after that, I got a raise and a promotion. I was like, wow. what? <laughs> All this time wow. I've been avoiding conflict, but it was the very thing that led to that. So that was like step one. You know, if I can get through it once, I can do it again. So I started practicing boundaries more and more. And I define boundaries just to back up a little bit. Mm -hmm. I define boundaries as what you will and what you won't accept in your life. Mm -hmm. So when people show up in your life, you have these boundaries. If they, you know, if a stranger touches you on the face, you're like, whoa, maybe you won't accept. I won't accept that in my life unless it's really a unique certain circumstance. But when that happens, you go, wow, I won't accept that. That's unacceptable. If you do that again, I'm out of here. We have a problem or I'll slap you or whatever it is. And you show them that there's an accountability, there's accountability for their behavior. So I like to look at uh, my values in my life. What do I value and what will I accept and make sure that I am solid in those so that when somebody violates one of my boundaries, then I can say, Hey, look, that's a violation. So the, the, the question that I ask myself, what would I do or say if I had absolutely, fear, absolutely no fear of the consequences typically will identify and define your boundaries for you. Mm -hmm. um, they, I mean, there's going to be times when you're going to be overboard and you're like, oh, I just punched that guy in the face. That may not be a boundary, mm -hmm. but it's going to help you start to define what you will and won't accept in your life. And so I started going forward with um, the idea that what would I do or say if I didn't have any fear? And I started testing that over and over again. And I tell you what, every single time, this is without fail, every single time I wanted to do my old conflict avoidant thing, I instead did the one that I feared that I really wanted to do or say. And every single time it has worked out better than I could ever imagine. Not only because I, I got to be myself and say what I wanted to say or do what I wanted to do uh, within reason, but in a boundary sense, um, but also it gave me closure. I, I didn't have to carry it around with me. It wasn't lingering anymore. And wow. this works in relationships too. When you are honoring yourself in a relationship, like, Hey, you know what, you, what you just said was very disrespectful. It was very disrespectful. And, and I, I won't stand for that. That is the, that is the moment you stand up for yourself and you realize you're doing it at risk of the relationship because they might say, Oh, well, that's too bad because that's how I am. Yeah. Then you can say, well, <laughs> I, <guess you> could. <laughs> yeah. I know I make it sound easy. There's a lot to break down there, but we're running out of time. So I just wanted to. Oh, this is great. Mind. Great. And I, I mean, that's kind of where our story started because I think one of the first things I heard you say, I'm in this like indecisive place. And I think it was the overwhelmed brain on decision-making or something like that. And I'm like, oh, empowerment versus fear. The empowered decision might feel hard in the moment, but in the end, it's the, just what you said. It's the best. It's actually going towards the conflict potentially in a way that is clear and kind, right? So I felt like I had heard that before, but not in such a clear way. And the timing was perfect. So um, gosh, Paul, I knew we could talk forever. We could go on. We're going to have to have an episode too. Um, That'd be great. But I have really, really enjoyed talking to you. Tell us where people can find you and where they can get the mean workbook because that thing has been really powerful. And like I said, I've referenced it and I want people to have access to it if they'd like. Thank you. It's been an honor to be here and talk with you. And thank you for sharing your story, Dr. Jill. And um, you can reach me at The Overwhelmed Brain. Go to theoverwhelmedbrain.com. Uh, that is about empowering yourself, you know, building your self-esteem, your, your confidence and all that stuff we talked about, about building who you are from the foundation up. I, I like to look at it as disempowerment to empowerment. If you feel at all like you're disempowered somewhere, come over there. And then loveandabuse.com, loveandabuse.com is where I have the other podcasts. I have two podcasts. Uh, Love and Abuse is where I talk about difficult relationships, manipulation, control, emotional abuse. And um, we get into all kinds of subjects. It breaks down everything we talked about today and much, much more. And I think that if you're in any type of difficult relationship, that's really going to help you. And over there is where, we, I mean, she mentioned the mean workbook. That is the manipulation and emotional abuse uh, workbook that helps you understand the pinpoint the exact behaviors 
that you are can identify in your relationship that might be seen as emotional abuse. So that can be helpful to you there. And obviously you yeah, you know, super uh, work helpful. That out and, all the, and like I said, go. So I put both those links below and both on the YouTube and on the Facebook, I'll include all these links, Paul. And so grateful for the work you do and for bringing light to um, help people like me and everybody listening. Thank you again for your time today. Thank you.